Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? So hi, everybody. My name is Rashim Gupta. I'm a senior PM in the Azure, Microsoft Azure Big Data team. And today, we're going to talk about Hadoop in the cloud and real world lessons from our enterprise customers. So before we start, let's do a quick survey. How many people here use Hadoop on-prem? It's about 30%. How many use Hadoop on the cloud? Less, 20%. And how many of you use HD Insight by any chance? About 10% or maybe less. OK, so great. So I'll give you a brief intro on also what HD Insight is, and then we can talk about uh, the topic in hand. So. Uh, the session objectives and takeaways. So we're going to start by uh, talking a little bit about the enterprise uh, customer case studies. Uh, so how our enterprise customers use HD Insight and other Azure technologies. We'll then talk a little bit about what the advantages are of using Hadoop on cloud and the common challenges and solutions that we've, we've proposed uh, that we've seen uh, for our customers using Hadoop on the cloud. The key takeaways I'm hoping by end of the session that you'll, uh, you'll go away with is that Although there are a lot of challenges that you might feel, there, there are some common templates uh, that are there. So you just need to work uh, with the right, with your Hadoop vendor or the cloud provider to uh, use those templates. And also, when you look at your scenario, don't just look at like Hadoop or, uh, or like your big data problem. Look at it end to end. Like what business problem are you solving? And I, you know, if you were to pick a cloud distribution, cloud provider or Hadoop distribution, you should look at all the services they provide. So I hope you pick Azure, of course. Uh, and we'll talk a lot about the different services in Azure. But whatever cloud vendor you use, make sure uh, you look end to end. So uh, the outline, like I said, given that most of you don't know what different Hadoop offerings we have, I'm going to start. I just have two slides on uh, uh, Hadoop on Azure offerings, just so you know, as I use different words and terminologies, you know the terms. Uh, terms. Uh, I'll then talk about three enterprise customers uh, and how they use Azure and especially big data. We'll talk about the advantages of using Hadoop on cloud and finally challenges and then we'll open it for Q&A. Okay, so Hadoop on Azure offerings. Um, so, t so when we look at the Microsoft Hadoop stack, uh, it, it's, uh, we look at it as on analytics and storage, right? So if you look on the analytics side, if you look at this picture right here, this is using running Hadoop uh, distributions on infrastructure as a service. So what that means is uh, you just you, you come to Azure, you say how many VMs you want, and then you just install the bits yourself. So if you're coming from on-prem, this sounds like the, very similar to what you're doing on-prem, except it's on the cloud. So you, you are actually getting all the bits, and you're deploying it on uh, Azure VMs. Uh, in this particular case, uh, as far as your support with Microsoft is, it's only for the VM issues. But if you have any, anything, you're, you're still responsible for installing, deploying those bits, and maybe working with individual uh, Hadoop distributions for any issues. We also offer platform as a service, which is called, Azure, which is called HD Insight. HD Insight is uh, our managed Hadoop solution. So uh, in, when you ask for HD Insight, what you get is not just, you will just say, I want a 100 node Hadoop cluster. We actually have partnered with Hortonworks, uh, and we will get 100 VMs from Azure. We will install the bits, and we provide full support. So what you're getting here is not just, you don't even have to worry about uh, what, you, you just tell us what version, uh, how many nodes, and we take care of the distribution, monitoring, managing. If there are any issues, you talk to us. We provide full enterprise level support, and we work with Hortonworks if needed. Uh, but that's what you get here. Right, so two different paradigms. Again, this is infrastructure as a service. This is platform as a service. Most of this uh, presentation is more focused around HD inside. But if you have any particular questions on IAS, I'd be more than happy to take them. Uh, again, as far as storage goes, we give you a lot of options. If you're coming from on-prem, typically the cluster where you're running compute is the same cluster where you have your storage, right? And that's called HDFS. So while you can do that, and that's what we call local HDFS, we recommend you use cloud storage. So we have two different cloud storages. The basic one is Azure Blob Storage, and uh, our analytical store is Azure Data Lake Storage. We'll talk more about both of these, but again, just remember uh, when I'm talking about storage, I could mean one of these three. Uh, and both Azure Data Lake Store and Azure Blob Store are cloud stores. So, uh, so with that, I think uh, we at least you, you should have a good picture of what different uh, offerings we have. Uh, I, there is one picture that's not missing here, which is Azure Data Lake Analytics. 
That's not here because that's not our Hadoop offering. Uh, if you have questions or if you've seen, I'd be more than happy to take it in the Q&A, but that's missing here. Um, so HD Insider, just a few, this is my last slide on HD Insider, and then we'll start talking about uh, cloud uh, in general. So uh, like I mentioned, HD Insight is Microsoft's managed Hadoop as a service. It's based on 100% uh, Apache open source, 100% uh, uh, open source Apache Hadoop. So if you're using any, if you're using HTTP or any other uh, Apache Hadoop distribution, you're, it should just work if you come to us. Uh, we are built on the latest releases across Hadoop. Uh, so right now, uh, so as soon as Hortonworks releases any of their bits, we actually bring it over within a few weeks after testing it on Azure. Uh, it is up and running in minutes with no hardware to deploy. So you really come to us. It's as simple as saying, I want a 100 node cluster uh, with you know, the latest Hadoop version, and we deploy it for you within minutes, and you can just get going. Uh, you can run on Windows or Linux. We actually started HD Insight with Windows, but we got a lot of customer feedback that people would prefer it on Linux. So we also uh, now have it available on Linux, and both, both of them are first-class citizens. Uh, so they're all on par. So whatever uh, platform you prefer, we provide support for that. Um, and finally, it's supported by Microsoft, right? And, and I cannot speak less for that. This is one of the big things that our enterprise customers love because uh, they already have a lot of uh, 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 support agreements with us, and this fits nicely, nicely there. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about our customer case study. So I have about three customers uh, that I'm going to talk about and how they use, uh, how they use Azure and especially HD Insight. So the first one is Rockwell Automation which is one of uh, the six oil and gas super majors. And what they do is they have about 350 gas stations around the country, uh, which provide uh, LPG, right, for, uh, uh, for cars. And most of these are unmanned. So their business problem was, how do, you, how do we make sure that we are on top of the maintenance? Uh, and like if I have to send maintenance trucks, how do we make sure I'm sending it to a region where I can do similar maintenance in that region? versus sending my trucks zigzag all around the country when needed, right? So it was a lot of, if you think about it, machine learning and predictive maintenance to figure out uh, clustering of problems, and, so, and based on that, making business decisions. So, so that was the high level, uh, what the problem they wanted to solve. What they did was they actually put a sensor in every, each one of these gas stations, and which would send a lot of, uh, I think, 10,000 data points every second, which would then get uploaded every five minutes to Azure Blob, which is our, if you remember, which is our cloud store. Uh, once it reached Azure Blob, uh, they would run uh, Hive or Pig. Hive is our SQL on Hadoop, and Pig is more like a procedural language to do data cleansing. They would use Hive or Pig and use Azure HD Insight, which is our Hadoop offering, uh, and then use that to perf do their uh, to, to find out the proprietary algorithm for the predictive maintenance. Once they have that, they send it to Azure SQL DB, which is then used for reporting, uh, ad hoc querying. And they also send the same, um, if, if they do find any predictive, uh, through their predictive analytics, if they do find something needs maintenance, they actually send an instant notification to uh, using mobile, Azure Mobile Notification Hub to the mobile devices. So this is an example of how a customer like Rockwell Automation used uh, a lot of different Azure services to solve a real-world business case. If you're interested, we also have this on our website. Uh, more details on this. Another example is Just Giving. So Just Giving is uh, a social network. What it does is uh, they actually find out what your interests are and what you, what kind of things you really care about, and use that to suggest some uh, some nonprofits or some you know places where you might donate. Um, so that's what they do. Uh, so if you think about it, it's really a lot of graphing, graph problems. Um, so, so their scenario was they upload using SQL Server on-prem, they upload data to Azure Blob, um, and then up using HD Insight, they actually had, I think, I believe every day they had about 20 to 30 gigs of data coming in, and then uh, they would implement their machine learning algorithms in HD Insight, which would multiply that to like 100 gigs, because a lot of graphing going on, uh, which would then, go to the activity feeds from there uh, using Azure tables that is fed real time to customers. So in real time in their feed, they would figure out uh, what they want to show, uh, what kind of you know, uh, donations they might want to give, what kind of nonprofits they're interested in. 
The third one is one of the leaders in, in wind development. Uh, and they have a lot of hundreds of wind farms across the globe. And each wind farm has 100 plus turbines. And their goal was again, uh, they, so each wind turbine would generate like a lot of data, right? And their goal initially was just they needed cheap storage. So they didn't even know what to do with it. So they just uploaded all the data in Azure Blob, right? With the expectation down the road that they would use it uh, for analytics. So down, eventually, once they had enough data, they, they thought, let's try to make some sense out of this data. So they ran a lot of uh, ad hoc analytical queries on it. And one of the things they found was that uh, there are some generators in these windmills which cost like millions of dollars. Uh, and the main reason why they, they kept having those uh, problems were because one of the filters would, 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 uh, would not work. So they, using, using this, they actually uh, replaced those filters on a periodic basis, which helped them save millions of dollars in costs. So these are just three examples of how enterprise customers use Hadoop. Um, so now let's talk about the advantages of using Hadoop on cloud. Um, so we're going to first talk about the cost savings. Uh, next, we're going to talk about agility, uh, elasticity, um, integration with other cloud services within Azure, and choice of deployment models. So cost savings. Um, so firstly, to use HD inside or even other Hadoop cloud distributions, you don't really need any hardware license or service-specific support agreement, right? You just create an Azure account. You can uh, and just start using it. So, so it's pretty uh, simple and straightforward to use, and you only pay for what you use, right? When you start a cluster, uh, from the moment it's, it starts uh, and to the moment you like stop using it, that's the only time you pay for it. Once you've stopped using it, there's no more charging. So, uh, so you only pay for what you use. Uh, you can independently scale storage and compute, and this I think is one of the biggest uh, cost savings, uh, which is not very obvious. But if you think about it on-prem, you use the same cluster for both storage and compute, right? So as your storage grows, you have no choice but to keep increasing your cluster size, right? Uh, and same goes for compute. If you're, if you're not using a lot of storage, but you have more and more users submitting queries, you will have to keep increasing your cluster size. Uh, in cloud, you can actually separate the two out, right? So like I said, you can use cloud storage and you can use compute. Uh, and they are two separate. Because they're separate, you can increase one uh, over the other without increasing the cost. And uh, actually, storage is very cheap in, on the cloud, too. So, so, so that's, another, that's a big cost savings right there. Uh, since we are doing all the uh, deployment, monitoring, and you know, support for you, you don't need to hire a specialized operations team. Uh, in fact, one of the studies said there's more than 60% lower total cost of ownership uh, of using cloud than on-prem. Um, so I talked about agility. Um, so agility is using, uh, you can be up and running in minutes, right? So once you ask, ask us to start a Hadoop cluster, it can, it can run in minutes. There's absolutely, very, there's absolutely no cluster management needed. Uh, we deploy all the bits and services, and we also provide you support. So it's super fast for you to use. In terms of elasticity, uh, you can both scale up and scale out. So scale up means once you have a particular SKU, uh, that we have, we actually offer 11 different VM types with different memory and CPU types, right? So you can, you can increase the size and you can actually decide uh, on a per, like if you, as you're bringing the cluster up, you can decide which VM type you want and you can change your mind later. So we allow you to scale up. We also allow you to scale out. So you can choose all from like one node to thousands of nodes as much as you want. Uh, if, once you have a cluster running, we even provide you a slider bar to like reduce or increase your cluster. So you don't, again, a lot of uh, choices there in terms of the cluster size. Um, integration with other cloud services. So uh, if you noticed, all the three examples I gave you, none of the customers only used Hadoop, right? They used a bunch of different Azure services. And that's something you know, we've realized over time that customers use different Azure services. And so we have, come, we have uh, what we call Cortana Analytics Suite, which is now actually renamed Cortana Intelligence Suite, if you, if you uh, do read up on it but which provides different Azure services which you can use. So for example, uh, right, right from the start, it provides a lot of info management, information management services like Azure Data Factory, Azure Data Catalog. Uh, so Azure Data Factory allows you to create pipelines and scheduling. Uh, and then that connects to, then you can use big data stores so we, like Azure Data, Lake Sto Azure Data Lake Store and Azure SQL Data Warehouse. Uh, we have machine learning and analytics, that's where HD Insight fits in. And then you can use our different visualization tools. So the, so the bottom line is, if you do read up on Cortana Analytics, that's where Azure HD Insight fits in. Um, and 
eventually you will end up using multiple services uh, for your scenario. Okay, so there are different cloud deployment models and uh, this is also something interesting that the cloud gives you. So if you look at the always-on cluster, if you're coming from on-prem, this probably just sounds natural to you. What this really means is if you come to the cloud, you can just start a cluster and keep it running 24-7, just like it is on on-prem, right? Uh, so you can use local HDFS or this uh, cloud store here. You, if you want to schedule jobs, you can use Uzi. Uh, and essentially, there's really no need to da for data persistence or metadata persistence because you know, you're using uh, your clusters up and running all the time. However, we've seen more and more of our customers using the, another deployment model, which is cluster as a service. What this means is, what they do is, they, if, if your job only has three hours of worth of work in a day, uh, so what they do is they start a cluster, run, run it for three hours, run their jobs, and then they kill the cluster. While, so while they, I mean, this sounds good, what happens to your data and metadata, right? Because once you kill the cluster, that goes away. So because we use cloud storage, your data is persisted, and you can also use Azure SQL as your Metastore, persistent Metastore. Uh, so, um, so, based, so because of this, now your data is persistent, your metadata is persistent, so you can kill, delete your cluster and bring it back again, point it to the same Metastore and store, and it, it would be like your cluster never got deleted. Uh, also, if you do want to do scheduling, you can use our uh, Azure Data Factory, which allows you to do scheduling and pipelining outside the cluster, because since the cluster is not even running, you can't use Uzi, right? So that's where Azure Data Factory comes. So again, the key point is using different Azure services here is an example where you can save a lot of money because if you just have a job running for three hours, I would rather have like 100 node, three hour cluster than a 10 node cluster running for 24 seven, right? Probably this is cheaper and more, uh, more performant. Okay, so now that we uh, talked about the different mod uh, deployment models, let's quickly uh, switch gears and talk about the common challenges and solutions uh, that our customers face on the cloud. Uh, so we're gonna first talk about scaling cloud storage for big workloads. We will then talk about the hybrid scenario where as customers move from on-prem to the cloud, what kind of data and metadata migration problems they see. Uh, we will talk about extending Hadoop to third-party applications We'll talk about security and compliance, and finally, you know, the enterprise tools that customers want to use. Okay, so let's first talk about partitioning. So if you remember, I, I, I talked how great separating cloud uh, storage, how great storage, separating storage and compute is, right? So uh, it works up to a point where separating storage and compute uh, uh, is performant. After some point of time, it, start, it stops being as performant, and this was noticed uh, by a few of our customers. So what ends up happening is, think about it, if you just have one account, one storage account, and you have uh, different partitions, like you have three different partitions, right, with multiple files under each directory stored. Th this is all in the same account. Let's say you have a thousand mappers running, all of them trying to read one partition, right? They will all hit the same account, uh, storage account. So what ends up happening is soon this becomes the bottleneck because all thousand mappers are going to read the same storage account, right? Uh, so this was a problem that was observed by our customers. So what they ended up doing, the first step they did was actually, instead of having one storage account, they had multiple storage accounts. So in this particular example, because they had three partitions, they would create three different storage accounts, where each storage account would have uh, only, data, only data for their partitions, right? So now, again, while this sounds good in principle, if you think about it, what ends up happening is, again, if you have 1,000 mappers, they will all, uh, because of partition pruning, they might end up all reading from the same storage account, right? And again, this storage account still becomes bottlenecked, right? So even this will not work. So if, let's, before we move ahead, let's just recap what we did. So in, in this particular case, you just had one storage account and all partitions were under it. In this particular case, you had three separate storage accounts with each storage account uh, for files under that partition. And this didn't, didn't work either because, again, if you have 1,000 mappers, they're all trying to read from the storage account. So the ideal solution should be because first mapper will want part zero, second mapper will want part one, third mapper will want part two. So the ideal solution is instead of putting all these parts under the same storage account, you should put, shard them horizontally, right? And so that's what a lot of our customers ended up doing is, if you notice now, it's the same partition is split across multiple accounts. Uh, 
this worked, and this works great. In fact, we have uh, something called as Dash, if you search online, which is now we've open sourced. Uh, it works great, except it's a pain to use, because f f I mean, it took me a while to explain to you. Uh, you can imagine actually coding this, uh, because now you have to change your Hive code to have the knowledge of physical location into your logical partitioning key. If you're interested in the code, I can talk offline and share that with you. Uh, that's just one problem. There's also other problems of like governance. If you want to restrict files, now you have to think about how to do this partitioning across so many accounts, right? Uh, and this, this can happen across like, uh, like all the cloud stores that are there, which are not analytical. So based on our customer feedback, we have just announced last, uh, last fall the Azure Data Lake Store. Uh, so again, taking a step back, in the first slide I showed you, we have Azure, the two types of cloud store, Azure Blob and Azure Data Lake Store. This is Azure Data Lake Store, which is, an, an, which is optimized for analytical workloads. So Azure Data Lake Store improves cloud store limits uh, because it, is, it has no limits on file sizes. And truly, we've tested it with like a per, per terabytes of data, and it, uh, it works. Uh, it's analytic scale on demand. Uh, there are no code rewrites as your file sizes increases. Uh, it's optimized for massive throughput. Uh, it's also optimized for IoT with high volume of small writes. Um, also, uh, Azure Data Lake Store is a web HDFS implementation. So if you have any other big data services that speak web HDFS, they can integrate with Azure Data Lake Store. So this is an example of how, you know, based on cust and customer feedback, we've gone and built a service. Uh, OK, so this next um, challenge that I want to talk about is in a hybrid cloud. Uh, what happens in a hybrid cloud? So before we even like, go into the nuances of this, let's understand why customers may want to even use hybrid cloud. So what, what, what we've seen is customers start using an on-prem cluster. right? Uh, things look good. They have an ETL pipeline running. They have some reports coming along. Everything's good. As more and more, uh, more, and more employees learn about big data technologies, more and more of them connect to this cluster. And now what ends up happening is uh, you, have, you started getting a lot of like, uh, BI users connecting to the cluster, trying to make reports or do ad hoc queries uh, on top of the cooked ETL data right, that was generated. And uh, your production ETL pipeline has a strict SLA. And soon there is contention of resources. So you might increase your cluster, you might increase your cluster, but that only works until a certain point. At some point, what you want to do is leave this cluster alone and make it a production ETL cluster and have all your BI users in a separate cluster, either on-prem or on the cloud. And that's, where, that's one scenario where customers start thinking of the cloud is maybe let me have my BI users start using the cloud uh, and let's keep the on-prem thing working while it's going. Uh, so great, so now we know why we want to do this. The only problem is uh, the BI users want to get uh, data as soon as uh, as soon as data is created here, right? As soon as the ETL production job is done uh, and the results are cooked, the BI users want to connect and uh, get that data. So that's one problem. The second problem is you don't want any downtime, right? You can't say, okay, while, this th while uh, I'm moving all my data and metadata here, let me shut this cluster down. That's not a possibility. So our goals, goals are, how do we have the minimal downtime here as we are migrating all our data from this cluster to this cluster? Because again, they have to be really almost in sync. If they're not in sync, these guys will see stale data, uh, and they will complain. And they might as well go back to connecting here, which is what you don't want. Um, in addition, you don't want to just move the data. You also want to move the metadata, right? So all the tables, uh, partitioning, meta database, all that information needs to be transferred over. Uh, and long term, you want to set up mirroring. So you don't want to just do it recurring, like do it one time uh, and forget about it. This has to be done uh, in an automated fashion. So. So for this particular case, uh, again, uh, sorry about the, uh, I don't know, I think while uploading this got uh, overwritten here. But so there are two paradigms here, data synchronization and metadata synchronization. In terms of data synchronization, it just means moving data from HDFS on-prem to HDFS on cloud. Uh, and you can, Microsoft and Hortonworks together worked uh, to release Falcon with AD, Azure Data Factory Connector. So with this, you can actually have constant replication of data between your on-prem and on-cloud cluster. Uh, so using this, uh, you'll, as soon as new data is created here, it'll move over. While data is copied over, metadata is not, right? So you still have to figure out uh, how to copy metadata. And it's important to copy metadata because without metadata, you know, you have to recreate all the tables and DDL on the other side, which is a pain. 
so for metadata synchronization, uh, if you, uh, if again, both of them are already on the cloud, it's super easy. You can just have them share the same meta store, right? But in this particular case, uh, they're not, one's on-prem and one's on the cloud. So, you, so if the on-prem cluster is using SQL Server, you can just use the always-on availability groups feature in SQL Server to replicate the metadata and keep them in sync nonstop between on-prem and cloud. So that's what customers do for metadata synchronization. Um, so using this, again, you, you'll, you'll be sure to have synchronization on both sides for both data and metadata. OK, so one of the other uh, questions that often comes from enterprise customers is, uh, how do we make sure that the Hadoop cluster that we've created on the cloud is an extension of our network? Right, so Azure has this feature called VNet, which you can deploy, which what it does is it creates a subnet within your network. So you can deploy a Hadoop cluster on the cloud, and using VNet, it will become a part of your network, so which will make sure all your, uh, all your uh, tools, et cetera, work directly uh, with, and stay within your network. So that's, what, uh, that's how you can extend Hadoop to your on-prem uh, corporate network. One of the other questions that comes is, how do I install my own workloads? Uh, because almost every on-prem customer have their own workloads, right? So based on that, like I mentioned before, we were on Hadoop. Uh, but almost all the tools that customers were using were on Linux. So we, since we offer Linux, you can actually go and install tools directly on the cluster if you'd like. So that's one option. If you do not like that, then we, the other option is script actions. So what script actions do is it's basically a bash script that can be provided where you can, uh, you, you, you can write uh, things to install from the external internet while the cluster is running or even uh, while the cluster is running or when it's being created. We also provide a lot of script actions ourselves. So that's the second option. Uh, thirdly, which is what we recommend, if, if, um, if you have a VNet, you can have like an edge node. An edge node is just another VM within your VNet uh, where you can actually install uh, your tools. And also the other advantage of having VNets is if your tools are talking directly to uh, worker nodes, uh, VNet and edge nodes will allow you to do that. So, so these are the three ways you can actually use to extend Hadoop beyond uh, the apps we provide. Um, so ISV solutions. So uh, what we also want, like one of our goals is to make sure you're very productive with Hadoop right uh, as soon as you start. And so what we've gone and done is we've worked with a lot of different ISVs uh, in the industry, and a lot of them are available out of the box. And I'm going to share some of them with you. Uh, the advantage of having these uh, ISV applications is they provide a lot more features than what's not available in Hadoop. Uh, for example, query designing, OLAP BI capabilities, fine-grained access control, drag and drop, uh, drop data pipelining, etc. cetera. Uh, some of these are data mirror. I'm not going to talk a lot about these. You can go uh, research, but data mirror quickly allows you to use uh, design queries in Excel and then run MapReduce underneath. Uh, you can use at scale, which allows you to run OLAP BI type queries. Uh, uh, again, use on a Hadoop cluster. Um, and Cask, which quickly allows you to create pipelines using drag and drop. So these are just three examples of uh, ISVs. We work with a lot more. If you have a particular need of one, you can come talk to us offline. Or if you are an ISV, we would love to have more conversations. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about security. Uh, so Azure Security, we today uh, we have encryption at rest, which is in preview, which was just announced a couple of weeks ago on the Azure Blob Storage. So this has been a demand, again, from a lot of our customers who wanted encryption at rest. So it's now available. So if you're looking for that, our cloud storage has this. Uh, and so the, the encryption at rest is uh, using Microsoft Managed Keys. We also partner with Blue Talon, who, which is an ISV, uh, which does provide multi-user access, authorization policies, auditing, row and column level security. Um, so, so you can also look at Blue Talon, and it works on HD inside out of box. OK, uh, so one of the I, uh, other uh, questions that comes often from our enterprise customers is, uh, they, while they're, not only do they want to use what's available in the open source, but they also want to integrate with the tools that they use in-house, right? So like a lot of these development tools. So for example, uh, as far as open source goes, already HD Insight works with Hue, Ambari Views, 
Uh, we support Jupiter and Zeppelin. Uh, in addition, what we have done a lot of work to extend uh, Visual Studio and IntelliJ. So if you are working uh, using Hive or Pig, you, you know, they work directly uh, in Visual Studio and you can actually integrate it with your projects. So here are some, uh, so, so, with, so we have deep in integration of Visual Studio and it's easy, for, no, easy to write simple queries. Uh, it's integrated with Pig, Hive, and Storm. And there's actually a playback that visualizes performance to identify bottlenecks and areas for optimization. Uh, I have some screenshots here. So here is an example of, of how actually, if I go to the next one, it's even, yeah. So this is all Hive code right here. So you can actually write Hive within Visual Studio. The way it works is you just download our Visual Studio plugin for HD inside, and then you can start writing Hive code. Uh, it actually uses IntelliSense to uh, fetch remote metadata. So you don't even have to remember the table names. On the left, you can see we have the list of clusters and what databases and table names you have. And on the right, this is like your solution explorer where you can add all your projects, uh, other files within your project. Uh, as far as debugging goes, again, within Visual Studio, you can see the job graph. But what's more important with the job graph is you can see more details like how many tasks, how long it took, how much data was read, and how much was written. So if you think your job is taking too long, you can quickly look at this job graph and you can figure out, okay, this particular, ta uh, this particular uh, reducer took too long because you know, it's writing one terabyte of data or something. You, if you select it, it'll actually show you which uh, Hive query is causing that. So it uh, makes you a lot more productive in debugging. This is uh, IntelliJ. Similarly, similar to uh, Visual Studio, you can see your clusters here. You can write your uh, Java Scala code here, and you can submit it to the... Uh, you can submit your job to the clusters. Uh, we also support Hue, like I mentioned. Uh, Hue is uh, state-of-the-art. Uh, Hue, along with Ambari Views, is what customers use to author queries uh, on Hive and Pig. Uh, we also support notebooks like Zeppelin uh, uh, and, and Jupyter. OK, so let's recap what we learned. Um, so the session objectives were to understand what the advantages of using Hadoop on cloud were and what the common challenges were. Um, and like I mentioned, I think if you must, um, when you, you saw that for each challenge, we did have a proposed solution. So that's something to keep in mind, is uh, a lot of uh, good work being done across the industry to solve these challenges. Um, and secondly, like I, I've shown you in a few examples, you shouldn't just look at Hadoop or big data as, as uh, one service. You should look at it end to end, right? Like in, within Azure, we have a lot of different services like in Cortana Analytics Suite, uh, Cloud Storage, Azure ML, uh, HD Insight, Azure Data Lake. Uh, so you should look at it end to end because when you start using cloud, you'll soon realize you're going to use the entire stack and not just one service. So questions? So Data Lake is still under preview, so I don't have numbers to share. Uh, but maybe if you take that offline, I can get back to you on the exact numbers. But Data Lake is supposed to be much more uh, performant. than obviously, it'll have a limit. I just don't know the exact number, since you know, it's in preview and it changes over time. So I didn't get the question. Is your question, will encryption come in Azure Data Lake storage? Uh, the answer is it's high on our roadmap. I don't have any timelines yet, but yes, that's something in our roadmap. <coughs> any other questions? Could you just say a bit more about the, the just giving example of the graph database stuff there, but support available for that type of so I have some of my colleagues here who might know more about just giving. I know as much as I said. So the question is, can you give a little bit more details on the just giving scenario, uh, especially what we did? You have any insights on that, Nishant? Or what exactly is the question? So what support is there for the graph database that supports that Scale-out architecture that uh, Hadoop provides. So 
So again, uh, that was part of their own uh, graph database and how they implemented it. And then we supported them with the underlying Hadoop cluster as the infrastructure for HD But we also have Spark, which has a graph library. We have a lot, like again, coming from open source and Azure, we have a lot of different. Uh, Even with Hadoop, you have Giraffe, which yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? Would you have your own absolute database, a la OpenPSDB, something from Microsoft like that? So, uh, time series database, I know customers have used the open source one. Um, I do not know if, I'm sure someone's probably working on it in Azure. I do not know personally. Um, Is that, yeah, from Microsoft. Open source, I know what is there, but you have tendency to have your product. Right. So again, I'm sure it'll, where someone's working on it, but I don't know personally. Yeah, but the encryption and managed keys, uh, who's over the managed keys and who's capable of uh, fetching those keys? Or are you give those keys maybe to the NSA? <laughs> so we have uh, the, uh, we have a, sorry, can you repeat the question so Arindam can answer that, so he's a security PM, so. <laughs> What's the question again? Yeah, about encryption. Okay. In the slides was mentioned, uh, managed keys. So who can fetch the managed keys? Because me as a consumer, I would be the only one who could fetch the key and not right. somebody else. Right. So, so the current implementation that uh, is in preview, So most of it, what I talked about was platform as a service, but there can be still be cost savings or infrastructure as a service because you can use uh, other technologies to do. For example, if you don't care about persisting your data or metadata, you can still use infrastructure as a service and bring your cluster up or down. So again, I think it's a little, there'll be more on the platform as a service side, but even on the infrastructure, infrastructure as a service, there can be. So like I mentioned, that what we saw uh, in, in this scenario, why we created ADL store. So of course, data locality will always help. Uh, but the point is, our, our, most of our customers do not reach that point where it becomes a problem. So sure, at some point it will, and then you can start using local HDFS. Uh, but until then, you know, cloud stores, starting with Azure Blob, moving to ADL store, I think should meet most of your scenarios. You really have to be in like big, big uh, workload to actually start seeing the effect, is what I'm saying. I, I guess to add to that, uh, it's, it's also a question of uh, trade-off. So how much of that, uh, of the performance scales that you get as part of your data locality, do you want to trade off uh, in, in time over maintaining both of them separately so that you can scale out both of these independent of each other? So let's say, for example, you have a environment where you have data locality, you would have to add uh, the number of nodes. But what happens when you just want more storage space? Do you really want to go ahead and add more nodes to it without using the compute power? And HBase is a perfect example of that. So when you separate it, you can just go ahead and add more nodes to compute it or keep lower number of nodes to compute it and keep on increasing your storage 
without affecting the performance of your clusters overall. So again, it's a question of trade-off as well. How much do you want to go ahead and uh, keep on adding more nodes to a data locale uh, cluster or keep it separate and maintain it in a more cost-effective manner? Also, we are doing a lot of investment in improving that further and further, yeah. right? Yeah. So, yeah. Question. So, so we're uh, we're adding more and more data centers. In fact, I believe Azure Data Lake is coming pretty soon to Dublin, right? Any other questions? I think we're out of, we have 50 seconds left. Any more questions? Or? <laughs> okay, thank you everybody. I'll be around if you have offline questions.